This is the IELTS listening test. You will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four parts. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. Now turn to part one. Part one. You will hear a conversation between two students talking about driving lessons. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Hi, Zach. I heard you passed your driving test. Congratulations. Thanks, Olivia. I passed just last week. It feels great to be independent and driving on my own. I really want to take driving lessons, but I haven't been able to find a driving school that will give lessons during the weekends, so that I don't have to miss any classes at college. The driving school that I used was brilliant and really flexible with their teaching hours. It's really close to the school. The address is 67 Kings Road. That's 67 King, apostrophe S, Road. Oh, that's perfect. I don't like the idea of driving around busy streets. Did your teacher make you drive in urban areas, or did he mainly teach you on roads in the countryside? My teacher said that I had to learn on both in order to become a good and experienced driver. We would start in the city centre and then drive north above the city. He sounds like a good teacher. Would you mind giving me his contact details so I can ask him for lessons? Of course. My mother's friend Daniel Smith referred me to him. His name is Alan Sutcliffe. Could you spell the surname, please? S-U-T-C-L-I-F-F-E. Thanks for helping me out. I'll give him a call tomorrow. I don't know if I should learn in a manual or automatic car. How do I decide? I wasn't sure which type of car to learn in either. In the end, I chose to learn in a manual car, because once you've learned how to drive manually, you can drive automatic as well. Most cars on the road are automatic nowadays. OK, I think I'll learn with a manual car too then. Hopefully the teacher will be able to give me lessons in the evenings after school. It would be much better if you take the lessons during the day. It will be far easier for you to learn when there is enough daylight to clearly see everything going on around you. But you need to be an experienced driver to drive safely at night. How frustrating. I was hoping I wouldn't have to take lessons during the weekends. You're right, though. Safety comes first. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Speaking of safety, you should wait until summer to start learning. 
It's really difficult and dangerous to drive in the wind and rain as a learner, so you should definitely wait until the weather is sunny and dry. Okay, that's perfect. Actually, it will give me some time to save up some money to pay for the lessons. Tell me about it. I had to work for months before I had enough money saved up. It was worth all the work when I finally got my driving license, though. The whole process is so expensive. How much did it cost you in the end? Well, each half-hour lesson cost thirty dollars, and then the final test cost fifty dollars. In total, it cost me about three hundred dollars. Gosh, it's pretty expensive. How did you find the test? Was it really difficult? No, it wasn't too bad, and the man was really calm and friendly. I knew that I would have to perform two parking maneuvers during the test, so I practiced them a lot beforehand, and that really helped. The test used to last forty minutes, but it changed a bit. For the first twenty minutes of the test, he gave me directions, and I had to just drive around. And then the last ten minutes was for demonstrating the maneuvers. So the test is thirty minutes in total. Okay. Great, I'll remember that. Do you have any more advice? It's really good to practice driving a lot outside of driving lessons as well. Whenever my parents were running errands on the weekends, I would offer to drive them. My driving teacher also told me to buy a notebook to write down everything that I've learnt in it, like a diary. Ha <laughs> ha! That sounds boring, but I'll do it if it helps. I found it really useful. Before my test, I read through everything I had written down, and it reminded me of a lot of things that I had forgotten about. It's really helpful for the theory test as well because there's so much information to remember for it. That's great, Zach. Thanks for your help. No problem. See you at school. Bye. That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one. Part two. You will hear part of a talk given by a member of staff at a hospital. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to fifteen. Now listen carefully and answer questions eleven to fifteen. Jane, what did you think of Professor Morgan's lecture? I don't know about you, but I find it incredibly difficult to believe that light influences the environment as much as he says. I've never seen any journal articles, websites, or anything that verifies his arguments.
It's stupid. On the contrary, I've seen a great deal of research supporting his argument from a wide range of renowned scientists. Have you looked at the recommended textbook listed on the course outline given to us at the beginning of the semester? All the information is in there. Perhaps you've just been looking in the wrong places. I never look at the course outlines. I have so many loose sheets of paper. I tend to lose anything I'm given by the end of the day. What's the textbook they recommend, and where can I get it from? I should probably go buy it soon. I'm already behind in the course. Yeah, you definitely should buy it. And our grades are more important this year. It's called the influence of light on the environment. You should be able to find it in the bookshop on campus. If not, they'll order it within two weeks. In the meantime, you should read up on Ken Simpson's work. He argues that in order to protect natural habitats, governments should endeavour to turn off lights in cities at night. Well, that's controversial. I doubt any government would be willing to do that any time soon. I imagine roads would become quite dangerous without street lighting. For this issue, Dave Kepler suggests they could just replace the existing lights with more environmentally friendly bulbs. They could even install solar-powered lights. That way, roads will be more eco-friendly while maintaining safety. Although I guess they wouldn't be particularly effective in colder countries, especially during the winter. That's quite a good idea, actually. The price of solar power is supposed to be on par with electricity within the next few decades, and it was on the news this morning. I've also heard that, according to Sharon Gray, in countries with more sunlight, insect-eating animals tend to be smaller in size, since there are fewer insects, and the remaining insects produced a smaller number of eggs. Yeah, I think I read somewhere that sunlight also has a negative effect on the quality of water, but I'm not sure I believe it. In many hot countries, particularly developing countries, there is a lot of water pollution caused by factories rather than sunlight. Nevertheless, Maria Jackson says that in direct sunlight, the surface of the water becomes more translucent. Therefore, it affects the amount of sunlight that aquatic insects can absorb. Not much research has been undertaken to prove Jackson's theory, but it seems to have been widely accepted anyway. I've never heard of that. I'll have to look it up on Google. The only other theory I've studied is Barbara Swallow's study on how declined insect population adversely affects the frog population. Not that I'm complaining. I hate insects, especially spiders. You have arachnophobia. I never would have guessed. Didn't your brother have a pet black widow spider? Yes, he did, and I hated it. It escaped from its cage once, and we never found it. I had nightmares for months. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions sixteen to twenty. Now listen and answer questions sixteen to twenty. Okay, now I'm getting goosebumps. Let's change the subject. What's your stance on natural and artificial light? Honestly, I'm not sure it makes much difference which one you use. Species will die out either way. I think the real argument we should consider is global warming and protection or replacement of finite fuels. Solar power provides us with an incredible opportunity to replace electricity, and governments should definitely increase spending on research in this field. The theories discussed in our lectures, like Simpson's and Gray's, are so vague and lack proof. So I don't understand why we even study them. I see what you mean. I don't like learning unsupported theories for exams 
and I'd rather spend my time learning something else. For example, I'd be much more interested in studying the animals in safari parks than researching migratory birds, particularly the effect of tourists on the quality of life of animals. As we know, every year thousands of visitors will drive in their own vehicles or ride in vehicles provided by the facility to observe freely roaming animals. Yeah, that would be really interesting. Especially those animals living in more tropical countries like Borneo. Following on from that, I want to study how bringing animals over from foreign countries to put in our zoos affects their life expectancy. For example, do you remember when China sent pandas to Edinburgh Zoo? Apparently, one of the pandas became depressed, but it was never explained why. To me, obviously, you can't take an animal out of its natural habitat and put it in a cage on the other side of the world. It just doesn't work. That is the end of part two. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part two. Part 3 You will hear a conversation between a professor and a student talking about taking a course. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Excuse me, Dr. Twain. May I speak with you for a minute? Of course, please come in. I am Charlotte York. I am considering taking your course in tourism. Right. Well, Charlotte, how can I help you? I have been considering studying tourism. However, it is such an important decision that I would like to seek some advice about it first. Would you mind answering some of my questions? Absolutely. Fire away. Well, I have been discussing courses with my parents, and they are concerned that I will not be able to get a well-paid job with a degree in tourism. The reason that I want to study the course is that I have a great interest in the subject, and I think I would really enjoy it. I believe the only way that I will enjoy my life is if I enjoy my career. Happiness is far more important than money, don't you think? Absolutely. I would much rather be happy and poor rather than rich and miserable. Money cannot buy you happiness. I'm glad you agree. You needn't worry about money, Charlotte. A large part of the tourism course is dedicated to teaching students how to manage finances a skill that you can apply to your everyday life as well. I would also recommend that you take a sideline course in time management, as this can be incredibly useful in efficiently planning your workload. Efficiency is the key to success. I'll remember that. Now, I have found that some students have natural talents that really help them to succeed in the course. Communication skills, for example, can be very beneficial. Do you have any strengths? Maths was always my favorite subject at school, so I really enjoy solving mathematical problems. However, I find statistics quite difficult. 
I have always been very capable and self-sufficient. I have a lot of confidence in my abilities and will take the initiative in situations without needing to depend on anyone else for their help. That's a really great quality to have and will be particularly useful if you choose to study tourism. That's great. I would recommend that you spend some of your time researching the course. A lot of people who are uneducated on the subject claim that tourism is a shrinking industry and that it will become irrelevant in the future. If you study the published research, however, you will see that the truth is quite the opposite. The industry has, in fact, grown significantly as people have developed an ever-increasing interest in culture and travel. Have you compared the university course with the polytechnic? Yes, I have. I was interested in studying the course in modules. However, the university doesn't offer that option. I don't have enough funds to be able to attend an expensive university, so I was relieved to see that the course is quite affordable. I also considered attending a summer school instead of university to save money, and so that I could work during the rest of the year. But I really wanted the university experience. I think that university would suit you well. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Now, what about the courses? Are you interested in any of the other subjects on offer? I have looked at a few. I was interested in travel and business as it sounds similar to tourism. That is really worth learning. However, be aware that it is difficult and will demand a lot of your time. OK, that's good to know. You might find that Japanese is an interesting course and it will teach you valuable skills in speaking the language. Personally, it's not bad and could be of some help, but not that much. OK, Japanese. Got that. What about medical care? Well, if you have time, the course will teach you a lot about curing diseases and illnesses or dealing with injuries outside, although it's not essential. So, OK, if it's useful, I'll take it. If you enjoy using technology and are worried about fulfilling the entry requirements, computing is very relaxed about the skills that applicants must possess. I'm terrible with computers, so I'm not sure that I would enjoy that course. How about public relations? Yes, I would recommend that course. It would be related to entering the tourism industry as it will educate you on how to approach clients and develop associations with them. That's great. Thank you so much for your help. That is the end of part three. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part three. Part 4 You will hear the beginning of a lecture about the Roberts Company. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
will listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good morning. In the last few lectures, I've been talking about the history of technology in the modern world. But today, I want to use Roberts as our case study, which is a company that develops complex camera technology for a range of industries and disciplines. Since the camera was invented in 1816, it has changed and improved dramatically, with cameras now in existence that can fit on the head of a pin. The company has been founded on a series of principles by which the company operates in its day-to-day -day business. The most important of these being to enhance the present development of camera technology. Roberts has a philosophy pioneering innovation, having been responsible for the invention of numerous technologies since it was founded by Dwayne Roberts in 1957. It has achieved many of its aims over the years, but its principles and founding aim persists through time, which is to explore new facts and imagine the unimaginable. The cameras produced by Roberts have a multitude of potential applications that are currently being explored. One of these is an anti-gravity camera that they aim to attach to a space satellite from where it will record live, high-definition video and provide fascinating new views of planet Earth. It could also prove useful in exploring other planets by providing researchers with never-before-seen images of the universe. Roberts are also experimenting with attaching the cameras to small drones that will fly through the rainforest in search of plants that could be used to develop future medicine. The camera also has the potential to be used on the roads. As it is 20% cheaper than the speed cameras that are currently in operation, this means that more of them could be distributed across the road network where they can control traffic by making sure that all cars abide by the speed regulations. Despite this diverse range of potential applications, the cameras are presently used for very different, more domestic purposes. Robert's cameras are presently used as nanny cams, which allow parents to watch their nannies to ensure that they are responsibly attending to the children that they have been employed to care for. These cameras give parents peace of mind and more control over their child's welfare whilst they are at work or otherwise occupied. The highest sales of the company are in toys that have the cameras hidden within them. This clever idea means that the cameras are camouflaged from view and do not look out of place in the child's nursery. The toys are also very robust, so children can play with them without damaging them in the process. The toys are designed to look like animals and come in a range of shapes, sizes and colors, as well as different animal species such as monkeys and bears. These toys are incredibly popular and can be bought in any toy store for only $20. Always eager to be constantly improving their products, Roberts are now working on a product that will change the way people see photography. This new contraption is a mini camera that is built into eyewear such as glasses and sunglasses where it can capture the world as you see it. Holiday makers and tourists no longer have to carry a big, heavy camera around with them on their travels. They can instead purchase a set of eyewear with a built-in camera, which will capture the moment with a simple tap. Roberts are also developing a model of this tiny camera for use during medical procedures and operations. The camera will be used during non-invasive keyhole surgeries to enable the surgeon to see what they are doing inside the body without having to make a large incision. This innovative application for the camera could make surgeries a lot faster and the saved time and energy will also make it far more efficient. As the patient will no longer have to undergo a large incision for their surgery, it also means that their recovery will be much faster with a greatly reduced chance of post-op infection. If any of you have an interest in working in this field of technological invention, Roberts is a very diverse and fast-growing company that would be a fantastic internship opportunity. 
Every year they organize a series of competitions where entrants stand the chance of winning a place in their internship program. So I would suggest that all of you enter. That wraps up the lecture for today. Please remember that attendance is mandatory. That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet.